Okay, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Meha Bailey, uh, and I am based in Cairo, Egypt. I'm a professor of practice at the Center for Learning and Teaching at the American University in Cairo. Um, and I'm doing this uh, because Michael Weinraub, who's a friend of mine from Twitter, was asking about good practices in hybrid meetings. And I was telling him about some things about virtually connecting, and then he had more questions. So I realized probably a lot of people these days have a lot of questions about hybridity. And also a lot of people by now have some experience in hybridity beyond what we used to do with virtually connecting. So maybe other people would like to jump in and join in. And so after we uh, set the time for this meeting at a time that works for Michael, he can't make it on time, so he'll come in later. But he did send me some questions. So we'll use some of his questions, some of your questions, and hopefully all of us will contribute to responding to the questions. Um, but I'll do a little bit of activity at the beginning just to get us comfortable with each other, because I feel like there are people I know from higher ed and Twitter and folks from the meeting innovation community. So it's a combination of people that maybe don't know each other. Um, so I'll give you time to get to know each other a little bit and also for all of us to get to know each other a little bit. So, I do have slides, um, and I will share these in a second, if I can remember where I put them. Okay, <laughs> yeah, here they are. All right. It'll be very quick with the slides. Most of the time we'll be talking together. So we called the session um, Intentionally Equitable Hybridity and Virtually Connecting because we're talking about this thing called virtually connecting. I've taken your permission to record. So hopefully everyone who came in later is okay. I like to start by saying assalamu alaikum. It's just, just means peace be upon you. And it works for morning, night, any time of day, because I'm guessing people are from different time zones. Um, and I want to ask you to tell me in the chat, you know, something like sleepless in Seattle, you know, how are you and where are you? So I'll just uh, take a look at what you guys write in the chat. So I am very excited and in my living room in Cairo. Where is everybody else? Let me know in the chat. And Dom, I saw you come in. I'm glad you could make it. Okay, I've got, whoa, cold but no snow in New Mexico. Glad to be here from my sister-in-law, energized in Ohio, Washington, happy to be here. Waking up San Francisco, breakfast nook turned office in 2020. I love breakfast nooks. Wide awake and curious, Nancy, in Massachusetts. Enjoying the sun, even though it's cold today, in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. Paris, 4 p.m., quite excited, by the week. Near Brighton, I love Brighton. Today's relentless rain has finally stopped. Melindy, coast of Kenya, grateful. Hi, Irene, so happy to have you here. In Alberta. Yeah, at your sister's place in Alberta. I remember you were saying sister's place. <laughs> Heather, happy to be entering this week. Grace and anticipation. Dialing from Southwest Colorado. Okay, generally very well in Seattle, Nancy, but heck, yeah, the virus. Sorry about that. Slightly sleepy, Dan. Snowy Saskatchewan. Heather, tired, a little tired in Germany. Dan in Vermont and healing from your accident. I'm so glad you could make it. Oh, wow. Jim, 101st birthday. Wow. Yeah, my daughter, I don't think you've, you've ever experienced that. So, <laughs> Hillary, chilly but cozy New England. Seriously good going, making 100. Yeah, right? All right. <laughs> okay, you work in person and also hybrid. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for, for letting us know. So I'm, I'm going to put you in breakout rooms in trios for eight minutes. I hope that's okay. Uh, and just talk to each other about, you know, why are you here today? What do you hope to gain? And what do you have to offer? Offer. We'll put the questions in the chat if that helps. Then you can take them with you to the breakout room. Ah, yeah, you're here. Welcome, Amy. And so if anybody feels uncomfortable, I'll create a quiet room um, in case folks don't want to be in a breakout room and don't want to talk. Or you can just come back to me if you're feeling shy or something. So you're in groups three or four. Uh, sure. Okay, Nancy, I'll go, I will do that. And um, I will also allow you to choose your breakout rooms if you decide to change for whatever reason. Give you eight minutes for this. Add a quiet room. I'll just call it the quiet room. And oh, Zan, there are two of you. So I'll put both of you in the same room. <laughs> I know when that happens, it's okay. All right, I think we are now in groups of three. 
All right. And here are the questions again. Yeah, so you can move yourself to the quiet room if at any point you feel like you need to do that. Eight minutes with 30 seconds to come back. Just talk about why you're here today and what you'd like to give and get, okay? I'll see you in eight minutes, inshallah. I may as well answer this question while folks are in breakout rooms, right? So why am I here today? I'm here today because I think we have a lot of experience with uh, hybridity and virtually connecting. And I've learned a lot from that in my more recent experiences of hybridity that I had to do for my work. Uh, sometimes for conferences that I uh, present at hybrid, but also organizing events in my own campus that are hybrid, teaching uh, faculty members in my institution how to teach in hybrid mode. Um, and so what I hope to gain is to also hear about other people's experiences and the challenges and see if they're similar to what we have or different. And what I have to offer is both my own experiences, but also the experiences of a lot of people from my community. So there's a lot of people who are here today who are uh, virtually connecting volunteers or they've, um, they've taken part in virtually connecting even as guests. We'll talk about what virtually connecting is very soon. Um, and there's also a lot of people here who facilitate in different contexts outside of virtually connecting. So I'm very curious about their experiences. Um, and I think we can all learn from each other. And I think the combination of a lot of people from higher education and then other people who may be facilitators, uh, freelance or in corporate or nonprofit context, I think that combination, we have a lot to learn from each other, but we don't often meet. And this is um, this is my new space of connecting those two groups of people who facilitate or teach in, in different ways uh, together. So I hope it'll be a good experience for everyone involved. And I'm going to bring them back in from the breakout rooms in around 30 seconds. So I'll pause the recording and come back. Hey, Alan. Welcome. Hey, Maha. Sorry I'm hey. late. I, no I had problem. another... I have another okay. meeting. How are you? Is it's everybody good. everybody's everybody in, breakouts. in breakout rooms and they're saying why they're here today, what they hope to gain and what they have to offer. Do you want to answer oh. that real quick before I close the breakout room? Uh, with you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm here because of you. Come on. Oh, okay. I'll bring <laughs> them back. That was quick. <laughs> no, 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 no. Be because I mean, you know, I mean, virtually My connecting this. Hi, Hoda. There, there's cats yeah. around somewhere. Um, <laughs> no, <high>. just, <laughs> yeah, just, just that, you know, we did so many great things with virtually connecting and, and it's gotten much broader and gone in such many directions. And I, I'd still, you know, I, I miss doing the, the, the things. And of course, you know, the, the whole pandemic kind of threw things for a loop. Um, yeah. But it's like, we all know, look, everybody's here. <laughs> yeah, everybody's coming back. All right. Thank you. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good discussion in your breakout rooms. And here's the link to the slides, which don't have a lot of text in them, but still, you know. Um, and uh, Alan just came in while you guys were in breakout rooms. So we had our little breakout room here in the in the main room, which is one of the things I like to do when I do um, sessions where I send people out to breakout rooms really early. When someone comes in late, I just have the breakout room right here, right? So that's always cool. All right, so um, I would like to do a little Mentimeter exercise before we start just to get to know everyone a little bit better. And uh, this is the link to the Mentimeter. And I use Mentimeter a lot because I like the colors, but it also turns out to be the most accessible for people who are visually impaired. And I have a student who's blind this semester. And so we tested all the different um, polling tools and apparently this one is the most accessible. So that's why I'm using it. And so the question is, Hybridity is important to me because someone's saying it's the way we'll be meeting now uh, and far into the future. What about others? My mind keeps reading humidity. That's very funny. <laughs> Here's the link again. And also there's a code at the top, 3402704. Okay, others saying allowed me to build a much bigger network. I'm guessing this is you, Rebecca. 
<laughs> a growing interest in our institution. Yeah, a lot of institutions, especially higher ed are interested, but also corporate, right? Open doors for people aren't in the room, acknowledges people having different situations. Yes, and that was always the case, but it was not acknowledged, I think. Helping organizations thrive in a hybrid world has been your focus for 21 plus years. I am looking forward to hearing from you because access matters. I love that. Very simple, very straightforward. We're all mixes in many ways. That's true. We're hybrid in many ways other than, you know, online and offline, right? We actually have been operating hybrid in many ways for many years, new context, yes. It's convenient, I agree. For a lot of people, it's really convenient. Um, more institutions are asking for hybrid meetings from facilitators, that is very true. One way we can bring people together wherever they are in real time, yes, including people that aren't able to attend in person accessibly, yes. Uh, it's how I've almost always worked, yeah, allows me more opportunities outside my work institution. Organizations won't pay for empty buildings now. Yeah, that's more inclusive than offering only an on-site option or only an online option. I agree. These are wonderful things. Thank you all for sharing. Well, what's my question? All right, and I just wanted to know, you know, in what context do you teach or facilitate? And you can answer more than one, obviously. Um, I, I work in higher education, but I also do some occasional freelance facilitation, um, and I do things for nonprofits as well. Okay, whoever wrote other, please tell us in the chat what that is. I'm sorry that I couldn't uh, imagine all the possibilities. <laughs> Quite a few other. We have freelance and corporate and nonprofit and higher ed and missing K to 12 altogether. So the other, yeah. oh, co-housing community. Yeah, good point, Rebecca. That's true. I did know that, but that's so specific that I wouldn't have written it, <laughs> even though I know you're coming. Oh, lots of other. What about the others? Let us know in the chat. Higher ed and nonprofit. Yeah, so you're hybrid and where you facilitate, Sam. Yeah, that's cool. All right, I'll move on to the next question. Well, and if anyone wants to keep typing in the other, please do. Okay, not actively teaching. Yeah, but you facilitate, right, Nancy? Come from administration, Olivia. Okay, thank you. And trained visual practitioners and facilitators, Center for Appreciative Inquiry. Okay, all right. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, it wasn't, yeah, I was just saying teaching or facilitating, depending on, you know, what different people do. All right, so this one is about your experience in online versus face-to-face -face versus hybrid and how high that is. Okay, so looks like so far, most folks have a lot of experience. So this means I don't need to talk a lot because everyone here will have some experience. But it seems that the thing that people on average have less experience in is the hybrid aspect. So most of you have a lot of experience hybrid just a little bit less which would sort of make sense given that i think it wasn't as popular uh before the pandemic and it's becoming a lot more popular these days uh someone here dom pates who's who has a podcast called i think it's called teaching here and there i think the podcast is exactly just about hybridity <laughs> uh, or at least the time he interviewed me and alexandra was just about hybridity i've got that one in the resources in the google doc amusing okay thank you all for this all right um and then there is another question on the mentimeter that i will come back to but i i will post it so that people can start adding to it so this is just a question you'd love to discuss today i want to keep it on uh, but i just need to do some something small and come back to it later um, I think it's still on, and I just want to go back to these slides, and I'll come back to your questions again uh, later on, all right? So these are Michael Weinraub's questions, and a couple of them relate to virtually connecting, so I'm just going to ask folks from the virtually connecting community to help respond to those, and then um, we'll see some other more general questions that I think everyone in the room might respond to, and I'll look at questions that folks from the room are asking, all right? So... Let's take a look. So his first question is, what's your experience with hybrid meetings or learning? And what does the term virtually connecting mean to you? What does it prioritize? What does it critique? And he's asking me uh, those questions. Um, but I also got another question from one of the participants who I think didn't make it today. And he was saying how to avoid online participants being either privileged or in many cases, really unprivileged in terms of participation. And the other is how physical setups and good practices would work for this. And so this is a lot about what virtually connecting was. And so um, Rebecca over here, 
is the co-founder of Virtually Connecting with me. Uh, and so I just want to explain quickly what that is. So Virtually Connecting, we call it a grassroots movement that challenges academic gatekeeping by at conferences, by, by bringing in folks who cannot physically be at a conference into the conference virtually via video conference. Um, Rebecca, do you want to just add a little bit here about how we started and why? How do you go? Sure. <laughs> just asking your um, question. Go ahead. Yeah, which was interesting because um, I had had some experience with um, being the hybrid person in the meeting or being the online person in the meeting where I had moved. And so I would go to meetings and people would bring me in on FaceTime. Um, and that at the time was really the only option, but <laughs> that was before a lot of the other video conferencing options. Um, and then um, what happened was I got to know Meha and I was going to a conference that she wanted to be at. And I was hoping to actually meet her in person at that conference um, because she was very involved in it. And I, it turned out she couldn't make it. And so when she couldn't make it, I said, well, I'll just bring you in on my phone. And so I figured, oh, we'll just do like a FaceTime or whatever. And Google Google Hangouts became a thing at about that time too, right? Um, and so we would, I would bring her, I brought her into that first conference and we did a whole bunch of, she had a whole bunch of people she wanted to meet with. And so I would be <laughs> the person running around trying to meet with people um, that she wanted to meet with. But it was really interesting because I really didn't know a lot of people. I was very... Um, yeah, I just, I didn't have a lot of connections within the community. And so it allowed me to meet a lot of really cool people yeah. that Meha knew, which was kind of yeah. like, so it was like a win on both sides. It was, yeah. yeah. And so, so the crazy thing is Rebecca said, I will offer to be your buddy. And I was on the organizing committee and I was responsible for the virtual unconference for that conference. So instead of just me meeting the people that I wanted to meet through Rebecca, we're like, oh, does anybody else want to meet them? And so we put it out on Twitter and Alan, I think you were one of the first people who joined, Alan's still here. Um, and, and different people would know on Twitter, oh, we're meeting this keynote speaker by virtually connecting, do you wanna join us? And people had no idea what this was, but they would join in and have a chat. And then people in the conference would say, oh, what's going on there, right? Rebecca, oh, Rebecca's here. Oh, Maha must be on the other side of her phone or her laptop or something. That was the first time we did it. But then after it ended, a lot of people were like, so when are you guys gonna do it again? And we thought it was like, I guess when we did it, we thought it was a one-off thing. And people also thought this would only work because of Rebecca's and Maha's relationship, that they care about each other. So they care about uh, connecting each other hybridly, but we actually expanded the people who are volunteering to do this. And we started doing it at more and more conferences. Um, and at first it was all about, oh, get the virtual folks to talk to the keynote speakers. But then it also became about, no, maybe there are other voices in the room that nobody gets to listen to. And maybe instead of focusing on just uh, dominant successful people, we can also bring in voices of students and people of color who can't, uh, who don't get listened to. But also, it also became always about the virtual folks who can't be there and their voice and having folks listen to them as well and making sure that you're choosing what the conferences that the virtual folks want to attend and the people that they want to meet and making sure that their voice gets heard. And what we always did is we had a virtual buddy and an on-site buddy. So one person was responsible for the people in the room, making sure to get them together, put them in the right room, make sure they have good audio or whatever. All of us connecting on one device, right? Usually someone's laptop or phone. And a virtual buddy who was at first me, but then Alan, Joe, and a lot of other people here in the room became virtual buddies. And the virtual buddies were responsible for making sure the virtual folks get listened to and have a voice in the room. And the on-site and virtual folks would communicate throughout to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak when they want to speak and how they want to speak. So I, I wrote out, you know, starting to think about what are some of the good practices that we did at Virtually Connecting that I think others could benefit from. Um, these are some photos from different ones. Alan, you mentioned this particular moment. This was a con uh, workshop we did where different on-site folks were connecting to a different virtual person on a different table. So this is one of the things that people always think, oh, if we want to connect to tables for small group activities, you'd have a person on site on each table, making sure that the virtual person is brought in. This is another one we were just connecting on a phone. This one where we couldn't find good Wi-Fi. So we went to the only spot in the conference, I think, that I had good Wi-Fi to have this session. Um, 
But yeah, so the main thing about virtually connecting is that access and equity were the most important things. I think we focused first, first on access and then we realized that equity was important once you could get to the room. If you had a good enough internet connection to be able to join the, the event, then we needed to make sure that you had an equitable voice. We always knew that inclusion was all, would always be elusive, but we still aimed for it and tried to improve it. We always focused on conversation, not content. So not like me talking all the time, like now, which I'm going to stop very soon. We always had smallish groups because Google Hangouts limited the online folks uh, to only uh, 10 total. So the facilitator, we also usually had a backup facilitator. So the buddy and the co-buddy or the backup buddy, and then eight other people. So, and then on site, we would have like maybe three, four, usually not more than five or six people. And that way the total number of people were never more than like 15. And I think that's huge. Like as soon as numbers get bigger than that, you need breakout rooms like we did earlier today. It's very hard to have a spontaneous, imperfect conversation with a very big number of people. You need to structure it a lot more. Uh, and so these ones were not structured. The only structure was we're talking about the conference, but you could also relate to things that happened on Twitter that week or you know, events and so on. And then this idea of distributed care to have someone on site and someone virtual. So when, I, when we do um, hybrid stuff in my own institution, I always say, make sure there's a teaching assistant taking care of the virtual folks or get one of your students to, to, to do that. And I'm curious how other people uh, do it in context other than higher education, and so on. So Alan is saying the live even eventness of it creates a sense of, yeah, the liveness, yeah, being live creates a sense of energy. Zan is agreeing on breakouts. And uh, Joe is saying five or six on-site takes real care to not become an on-site panel. Yeah, with Q&A from remote, that's true. Especially when they're all men. I remember there was one with all men, all beards. It, it would feel that way. And sometimes they, they're at a conference where they're in presenting mode. Nobody paid. The virtual folks did not pay conference fees. The on-site buddies, occasionally we'd lobbied the conferences to give them a, a pass, a free pass. Um, but the virtual folks never had to pay for virtually connecting. Remote advocate in the conference room is key. Yes, to create a more level playing field. Yes, Nancy, I agree. Yeah, it was not usually a part of a conference program, although occasionally some conferences gave us a special room for us so that we don't have to search for Wi-Fi depend on how friendly the conferences were. We weren't trying to be disruptive to them, but a few of them who didn't understand what we were doing were a bit worried at the beginning. Uh, but eventually um, some of them would give us a room. Some of them, was, some of them would put us on the schedule as well. Um, and so even though they were synchronous meetings, there's a lot of asynchronicity going on in the background and in between sessions to help sustain the community and invite people and find the right time and register people and one of the things we noticed is that we had to also reach out to people personally sometimes if they liked a tweet to say, oh, are you interested in coming? Because people didn't always know that they could sign up. Uh, we also had different a time zone converter on our website. But the key thing is we eventually, it was challenging academic gatekeeping and the way things happen. And we also did a lot of low tech adaptation. So there wasn't a lot of rooms that were made for this. Yeah, academic gatekeeping. So in general, in academia, and I'll, I'll stop sharing now and, and give people chances to talk about other good practices they have. Ours, we called our good practice intentionally equitable hospitality. So we, we realized it wasn't about the technology, it was about being hospitable. We created a hybrid space and how do you make sure that it's an equitable space, keeping that intention all the time and revising and improving all the time. And so the academic gatekeeping is, in academia in general, there's always, the, in, in my opinion, a lot of like who gets in and who gets out and who's excluded by a lot of practices that limit who can take part in things. And conferences are a very good example of that because people like me in my part of the world, to be able to go to a conference from Egypt to America, it costs so much more. My currency, which has just been devalued like a couple of weeks ago, is so weak that even if I have a really good salary to allow me to be privileged here, it's really expensive for me to go there. I had a young daughter when we first started. She's older now. She was really young. I didn't want to leave her. And taking her with me would mean bringing her and my husband. It was very expensive and very socially difficult and logistically difficult to manage. And then there are people who have uh, a disability that makes it difficult for them to travel. Bless you. So, um, so there's all of these things. So conferences make it really difficult to get in. Not anyone can be there. And usually it's the same people who are able to go to conferences all the time and the same people who can't. So that's a, that's a kind of gatekeeping. So virtually connecting with sort of, I don't want to be here. All right, I want to hear from others. What are some other good practices? I noticed that people like the idea of this, you know, virtual advocates and the on-site advocates. For us, this is like the main thing. What are some other good practices that people 
um, have experienced or have tried uh, with hybrid settings. And of course, virtually connecting volunteers can also offer. Rebecca, you want to offer one? I can see your physical hand up. Yeah. Yeah, and I have a bit of a different context. This is the co-housing context because before um, before COVID, um, we are building a co-housing community and we had a certain percentage of the people here in Nova Scotia, but then a lot of people that were not. I, at the time, was in California. And so we had people from around the world in different time zones um, all coming in to be able to be there for these day-long design workshops. It was really quite a painful thing to be online for, um, but it was really important to be online for it. And so it was a lot of retraining the people that are face-to-face -face in the room for how to do it. And so one of the tools that we use, it was really interesting was, and I started to tell this in, in my breakout when the breakout ended, was teaching people in the room to use a microphone and to use a microphone that's not amplifying, <laughs> right? So it feels like you're talking into this dead stick right, when it's going around the room. But if they use the microphone, it meant that the people online could actually hear what they were saying. Otherwise, you're trying to pick up a microphone. And I think that's got to be one of the biggest issues. And one of the things that we learned in virtually connecting as well, video less important than good quality audio, right? Good quality audio was critical. Um, you can have poor video and still have a great conversation, but you can't have a great conversation with poor audio. Yeah. I agree completely. And also, this is also why I think during the pandemic, I always said, let people keep their cameras off. You can still have their voices. Voices first, faces, not so important. It's nice to see faces, but it's just, you could carry on a pretty good conversation without seeing people's faces. We do it on the phone all the time, right? <laughs> um, Dom, you were saying uh, in the chat something about, you know, again, this is related to what Rebecca was saying, is like whatever tech is available. When I have to do a, a hybrid thing on the spot, I just use my phone and pass my phone around. If the phone is passed around, it acts like a mic and actually acts like a close-up camera to the person who's talking to the virtual folks. It works really well. I can do really small group work and I can do big group work and I take the camera to me at the front of the room if I'm the one talking um, and it's just a phone. You can have as many virtuals on the other side. And it's, it's, if, you're, if the room is not equipped to, to, even rooms that are equipped to get the audio from everywhere can get really noisy for the virtual folks. Because if people in the room are whispering, it might pick that up if it's a really sensitive mic and that's not helpful. But a phone will only pick up what's close to it. And that actually tends to work really well. Um, Dom, what were you thinking in terms of low tech? Well, I'm just thinking of some of the earliest experiments that uh, that I did in this particular space, uh, slightly prior to uh, encountering virtually connecting. But it, it kind of makes the same points. One, uh, audio is the key thing, really, as mm. uh, as uh, Re Rebecca made the, the point there. But then over and beyond that, you know, it doesn't have to be high tech to connect. You know, um, I've made various different kind of um, contraptions of bolting, plugging and wiring various different little bits together based on what I had on hand and what seemed to give people a connection between rooms and spaces uh, mm -hmm. across time. Yeah. Uh, and it's great to have, you know, the sort of top of the range kit to, to be able to do this, but it's not... Um, it's not a prerequisite for being able to connect. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know what else, when you were saying that we did at some point get a donation to virtually connect you with a very high end mic, but I remember it was heavy. Remember Autumn used to slug it around and actually became a hindrance because if she didn't have a dedicated room, she'd have to walk around with it all over the conference and it wasn't that comfortable. But I think at another point, Martin Weller, who's one of our advisory buddies, had a lighter mic that he could give around but then if you're at a conference and you use the room computer, sometimes the room computer doesn't allow you to install the software. It gets really complicated. And then sometimes you would have to do things to for the audio. You would have two devices and you have to mute and unmute to get something like that going. And so if you're alone as the on-site buddy, it's a lot of hassle. But if there are like two people, it helps a lot. Uh, so if you have someone who's your backup, it really, really makes a huge difference. So there, there are people who are really comfortable with trying to manage all that. And I, Michael, I see your hand. 
uh, and I'm one of them, but if it's one of my other colleagues, I really have to back them up because it gets difficult to manage everything. And it's not fair to the facilitator, right? You want the facilitator to focus on facilitating um, and still have someone have their eye on you know, what's happening with the virtual folks. Um, I'm seeing a lot of really good stuff in the chat. So I'll ask people to say those out loud, but I'll let Michael speak first because this is our session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, thanks, Maha. And, uh, and, and I'm sorry for joining late, but you know, I, I do want to interrogate, I think, a little bit the um, the statement that video uh, rather that that audio is more important than video or even that, you know, video isn't so important. Um, and I think it's a really rich question to to grapple with. But I know that for for some people with low two, two, two things and then I'll stop. One, for some people with low vision, that the video actually is a deeply important way for them to have greater accessibility. And then even for people with normal vision, um, the, 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 there is a certain additional element of, uh, of engagement and accessibility and understanding that, that video um, accommodates. So those are just two things to maybe mm, um, yeah. um, complicate a, a little bit um, how yeah. we see these two yeah. um, th these two things. Yeah. So I'll invite everyone to to jump in here and answer as well. I was gonna, I'm going to say several things. First of all, because virtually connecting is originally made for people who can't make it to the conference, a lot of them live in places where the bandwidth is low, and so Google Hangouts used to allow you to say how good your bandwidth is, and the quality of your video goes down if your bandwidth is low. And even mm -hmm. I sometimes, and I have an okay internet generally, but Egypt's best internet is not great. So I would, my, the video would sometimes have to be off for that reason. I think there were people who were first timers on video conferencing pre-pandemic when people weren't used to that, who weren't comfortable with turning their camera on while we were recording, but they turn it on after we stopped recording. And there were even people who weren't comfortable unmuting and they would type in the chat or be really quiet. And then as soon as the recording goes off, they start chatting like crazy, remember? And then their third time on virtually connecting, they start talking and then they, you know, they, the comfort levels change a lot. Um, I'm interested in what you said about accessibility though, because um, like, I don't know about what it's like for people with low vision. Obviously if someone's blind, it will make a difference, but I, you know, and if someone is hard of hearing, then seeing the lips might help. Uh, but I also learned now to use uh, the live transcription, which is not bad. If, if someone's accent is not too different from the dominant accent. Um, but I, I do know that some people who are presenting or speaking feel uncomfortable if they're speaking to a blank screen. So I understand that sense. Uh, I'm comfortable with it, but I understand that a lot of people aren't. Um, but, the, but the thing is, if I can see you really well, but I can't hear you very well, then there's no conversation. So if your focus is on conversation rather than presenting content, then you do want to make sure that the audio goes through. I'm, I'm curious if anyone else wants to comment on this, and then I'm going to call on a few other folks to say things that they've been saying in the chat. OK, I see a lot of people like the idea of using a phone. All right, um, there is um, Heather, who is talking about tech checks and the vitals checklist. I would love to see what that is. Could you, are you happy to, yeah, to elaborate? Happy, Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to share that. So I teach, um, I teach people how to tech host, but I also, when I am tech hosting, so an actual thing where I'm helping um, other organizations, teams, whatever is happening, whether it's a presentation or a class or uh, a meeting that I, if we know that we're going to use a lot of technology going into it, maybe new technology to the folks, I have what's called a tech check session. And in that, I kind of draw them in by saying, we're going to first start out by checking your vitals. And there are five vitals, your computer, your internet, your video, your audio, and your lighting. And that gets them excited because they're learning new things. Um, but at the same time, I'm doing it in such a way that it's um, engaging, that it's efficient, and that it's in um, equitable. So I'm really trying to set the tone for the folks that once we get into this meeting, I may not be talking at all, but I am there. So I'm trying to build trust in that tech check session and to cover any technology, like additional technology, whether it's Miro, Mural, or any third-party collaboration tools. And I try to make them short and also um, applicable to whatever it is their desired outcomes or purpose for the meeting is. That's awesome, Heather. I love the intentionality behind what you're doing and this 
as a process of building trust. I love it so much. And it also reminded me of something that I didn't mention. With virtually connecting, we'd always go in like 15 to 20 minutes earlier and invite mm -hmm. people to come in and test their audio and video. I think pre-pandemic, we did a lot more of this. I think during the pandemic, people were having online meetings all the time, all in a row. And then it was like, you barely have five minutes before something starts to start your next meeting and so on. But definitely yeah. that, and that element of also, you know, checking the lighting and helping them with all of that. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. And sure. Joe, you had said in the chat something about the templates that we developed at Virtually Connecting. We kept developing our process in ways that we could share with new people, right? So do you want to say something a little bit about that? Yeah, and I, I think that's that's exactly the, the biggest point. As the organization grew and it was really important to invite people to bring uh to bring virtually connecting into conferences that were important to them, uh might be how I would phrase it. The as as we really very intentionally tried to break down some of the these are some of the in-group out group, some of the leaders and followers and create a much more um, communal, a, a com create a community and not just a, a service. Um, it became really important to start writing down, here's how we do this. And, uh, you know, in an order of uh, one of the things that proved difficult for me was assessing how much remote interest there was versus who are we going to talk to. But at least signifying, you need both of those things. You need to know that there are people who want to come, and you need to know that there are people who want to talk, uh, people on site who want to take out of their conference time. You need to figure out when in the conference schedule it's possible to do things. Um, somebody needs to create the Google Hangout or Zoom links. Somebody has to send out the emails. Uh, you know, usually the virtual person has to send out the email to the other virtual guests that have those in them, and that. Uh, and we developed some template language so everybody didn't have to write a, a welcoming email on the first time. You can just use the same template language and it's fine. So there were a lot of things like that that the earliest folks kind of figured out how to do on their own. And as we wanted to welcome more people into that, into that role in the community, we needed to make sure that those things had been documented and shared. And that made it possible for the community to grow in that way. If we hadn't documented it, there are a lot of people who would not have, you know, been a virtual buddy without instruction. That's probably enough. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. That was that was really useful. And, and of course, this evolved over time. And now it's obsolete what we used to do with Google Hangouts because now there's Zoom and we haven't updated our documents. We're just winging it right now again. But uh, if we settle back into a lot of face-to-face -face conferences, this, this may revive. Um, Heather Settle Murphy, you were talking in the chat about, um, you know, making sure that on that online folks know what's happening on site and repeating stuff to them, right? I think it's checking back and having a virtual buddy who would speak up and let you know that you missed something. Can you tell us more about how you do it? And you said Heather Settle Murphy. Did you mean me, Nancy? Uh, no, sorry, Nancy Settle Murphy. Yeah. I okay, I want to make sure you weren't asking Heather because yeah, we have two Nancys and two Heathers, so that sort of okay. messed with my brain. Sorry. Well, the other Nancy. Nancy Sadly for us, can't talk. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> so yeah, so in the room, if it depends, a lot of my clients have owl cameras or something similar. So it follows the sound and it follows the person speaking. So everyone is remote, can see who, whoever it is who's speaking or standing up at the flip chart at any time. Um, if you aren't fortunate enough to have them, and many, I'd say most aren't, um, then it's about making sure, let's say if if we have people participating via, let's say via Zoom to make sure that the camera, I always like having two, but if we only have one, make sure that the, the remote advocate who's in the room, that liaison, the person responsible kind of for the care and feeding of the remote folks, make sure that they are on the quickly can take the camera and say, okay, let me just show you what um, what Heather just wrote on the flip chart. Or let me pause for a minute. If you heard everyone laughing, that's because Ed said blah, blah, blah. Um, so any of that sidebar conversation can be kind of translated. Yeah. So I think that's, yeah. that's an important role for someone yeah. in the room. Yeah. One of the things in my institution that we encourage very strongly is Share the screen to the Zoom. Don't assume that the camera will get the screen and it will be readable to folks. 
Um, and also, if you're going to write something, better write it on a, like a whiteboard on the screen for the virtual folks to see. And the on-site folks will see it on the screen versus writing on a flip chart or whatever. But the advantage of having a phone is that I can actually just flip the camera on the phone and show the thing that's happening wherever in the room. I actually teach in a room where I have six screens. So I just walk around with the phone and show them. But definitely, there's, there's always this, this constant awareness that there are some people who are virtual and you need to check in that they've, they've got it. I also have sometimes a funny situation, and Michael, you had shared a resource that highlighted this particular strange situation. We have more virtual folks than on-site folks, and in that sense, the virtual folks suddenly become privileged, even though usually they aren't, but if there are like 20 of them and only five in the room with you, that becomes an imbalance that is very strange, and then the on-site folks are like, why am I here? <laughs> Um, and that's that's also an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, even though you can see them, you end up uh, focusing with the virtual folks more. Um, and then maybe there are opportunities to do something in person better in person, and you end up doing it virtually. To so sometimes you got to do things slightly. Maybe use sticky notes with the people in the room and Jamboard for the virtual folks, or use Jamboard for everyone. And it depends on what's what's the right balance for you. One of one of the technologies that I think works really well in hybrid is polling tools because you, you don't use the chat, you use the polling tool, and then everybody's on the polling tool, and then you can talk to everyone, but still the virtual folks will use the chat, right, in ways that the on-site folks can't whisper to you every time they're thinking something. So um, there's a lot of other great stuff in the chat. Jacob, I think you were asking an interesting question about sessions that didn't go so well for you, right? Uh, yes. Yeah. Oops, you muted yourself. I'm yeah. joining. Joining in with a very poor sound, my apologies for that. So just to- We can hear you though. As a point to, all right, great. Uh, no, it's just like, um, I have two examples. So it's actually with you, uh, like at the, the session that you had at the University of Cape Town quite a while mm -hmm. back before COVID. I um, remember it. Mm -hmm. We, uh, that, that, that was one of those um, session where we ran in and put up a laptop. We had uh, made a sign up for our uh, our network, our virtual um, network in Virtual Africa, uh, but it, which is only operate as a purely online. So it was quite a new thing for us to do something uh, remotely hybrid. Um, but I just have this memory of, um, we, we had sort of like 10 people that ended up sitting quite alone and, you know, the sound was poor and and all of that. Or just for that session and another session that you you also did in Cape Town, uh, my memories is just this of rushing into a venue, uh, having to set up uh, a laptop in a very ad hoc manner, and not just just not having the time to to actually test sounds and 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 it also it came to my mind when you were talking about virtually connecting, where you where you also sound like you're sometimes running around to to find a room uh, and and find a Wi-Fi and. And it's just, I'm just curious about raising this point of, of not having the time to, to actually, um, mm, actually set, set things up yeah. properly. And, 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 in, yeah. and in that sense, that, that that's happening physically, get some kind of privilege over what's happening virtually. Yeah. So I'm just yeah. interested in how experiences and, uh, and, 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 and how well, other people have responded to that challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, so to be fair, I think one of the key things about virtually connecting is an informal context. It wasn't like a high stakes thing. If it didn't work, it wasn't a big deal. If we started a little bit late, people were understanding or the virtual folks would chat with each other until the on-site folks figured out what to do. In a, if it's a class and you have limited time or hi Elise, um, and you have limited time or it's a really uh, serious context or something, it becomes really stressful. You do need that extra time. In my class to save time, I just use my phone. The audio will go through, turn on the camera on the phone. If I don't know what the setup is in the room, this is really, really helpful, honestly. But hopefully, if you're doing something for a formal context, you can figure out what kind of technology you can afford and focus on the audio rather than the video again and focus on using the screen to share stuff so that if the camera isn't great and occasionally still using a phone if the audio in the room doesn't catch, all of this helps with a lot of things. So for example, in that session at UCT, if there was a problem setting up the mic, you could just give me a phone and then the phone is connected to the Zoom or the Hangouts or whatever you were using. And that would be how the audio goes. Just have a low tech backup, always have backup uh, technology. I think that's a good 
suggestion for any technology, honestly, always have a backup something. Remember back in the time where people would have uh, printouts of their handouts in case the PowerPoint wouldn't work? We don't need to go that far, but we need to do something. Uh, Joe, your hand is up. Well, I was going to say, as someone who did some on-site buddying, um, it took a while to learn how to scout locations effectively. And especially because like, I, I would try to get into the conference center the night before the conference when no one is there, which messes up your scouting. Um, and like, you know, I would find really nice spaces and other people would also find those nice spaces. And suddenly it wasn't a secure space that, that we could use anymore because there were there was already a group of people having their coffee in that space. Mm -hmm. um, one time I had no idea how much noise I was gonna pick up from an escalator. And I, I picked yeah. a space and, and there were huge environmental sound problems. So I think that's just a skill that eventually gets dialed in is learning to mm -hmm. listen for environmental sound and imagine it coming over a microphone into somebody's earbuds, not what you're mm. hearing in the space, but what you're going to be projecting. Remember Takes a while also, to get to. Remember also trying to avoid places where people would pass behind us because we were live streaming. Yes, right. Yeah. And so you didn't want someone to appear on camera who didn't mean to appear on camera. What if they didn't tell their wife they were at a conference or something? Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Seriously. And the but movements someone... behind also use also, up a whole lot more bandwidth. bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Nancy White is asking in the chat about uh, she's saying we're touching on this, but we want to hear more about how you kept the face to face from being the center of power from a non technical perspective. So this is intentionally equitable hospitality. I'm going to talk about this in a second in more detail. Uh, but part, a big part of it is to have a virtual facilitator who has a strong personality who can actually shut up per a person in the room in order to make room for more marginalized folks. And it's all about centering the folks who are farthest from justice and you might see videos of me specifically doing that and a lot of people were watching me and learning but recognizing if it's a white man doing that it looks aggressive but if i'm doing it it sounds like a social justice advocate but just sometimes uh to asking someone to please stop so that someone who's who's less powerful can speak that is a thing that we did um, and we also spend time with the virtual folks in those 15 minutes before they start to warm them up to give them more courage to speak up um, as well. And building community in between helps a lot. Um, and also when the onsite buddy was very mindful of that, because occasionally the onsite buddy was starstruck by a, a keynote speaker that is the invited speaker on their side and they wouldn't shut them up. <laughs> so. So I'm sorry I keep saying shut them up because actually what does happen is that some very powerful people want to just talk and listen to their own selves. And, and we want to listen to them, but we still want to have a conversation. We're not there to just listen to them talk and talk and talk. Um, I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that, but I, I wanted, there's, oh my God, 22 messages that I haven't read yet in the chat. <laughs> but anyway, if, any, if there are any links anywhere, please put them, someone help me put them in the Google Doc. Uh, we also used to have someone back in the day with Google Hangouts who would save the chat and send it to folks, but now I have my Zoom automatically saves it. I don't know if you guys do that. Um, let me just take a very quick look at what's in the chat. And we usually have a co-buddy. So today I don't have a co-buddy, but I can make uh, Rebecca my co-host. <laughs> and Alan my co-host, right? And that so, can help. I'm not a good doing... co-host. <laughs> you were a very good co-host back in the day. <laughs> Maybe you're a better host. Um, all right, let me just see if there's anything else I can say. Yeah. Um, QR codes are really good for, yeah, for people who are in the room with phones. Mentimeter has an option that can either show you the QR code or the link. So you give the link to the virtual folks and the QR code works for everyone. So What's it called again? Mentimeter? Mentimeter, yeah, the one I was using, this one. Right, um, right. Let me share it again. It's this thing. Right, and it has, I, I gave you a link in the chat and there's a number, but you can also show a QR code. And so that's really comfortable if you're in a room, uh, but virtual folks can just, you know, menti.com and put in the code that works as well. Uh, some people really like QR codes. Thank you. More, no problem. There's a lot of tools similar to, uh, to Mentimeter, right? Slido, Nearpod, you can even just, I don't like the Zoom polling because it's very limited um but yeah all right i i'm having trouble keeping, tra keeping track of the chat how can you manage persons with disabilities in such space that's such a good question so i was facilitating a session recently 
uh, where I knew I had my blind, uh, I have a blind student and I knew he was going to be there. Uh, Heather, I don't know if you were there, but we discovered halfway through that there was someone who was hard of hearing or completely deaf in the room as well. Um, with, with, with what I, because I now have a lot of experience, uh, if people are visually impaired, I don't tend to have a problem with it. The only thing that I keep in mind is make sure that all visuals are described. Either you give them the slides ahead of time and they have the alternative text, or when you show something with visuals, if it's a surprise, then always describe what's in it for them. Uh, people who are hard of hearing, I always have the live transcription on, and um, usually they have their own way of managing as well. So if you know ahead of time, one of the things I do when people register is to ask them uh, what kind of uh, accessibility um, needs they have and what I can do to help, which I emailed you guys, uh, most of you, if you signed up like two days ago, more than two days ago. I, I, I would have, uh, I sent something to ask if you have any accessibility needs. So with my Zoom registrations, I always ask ahead of time so that I know this before, before I meet the people. Um, and yes, Rebecca answered that question. Thank you. So yeah, the QR codes are built into Mentimeter, but you can also use a bit.ly. The bit.ly.com can create a short code for you or a, or a QR code for anything, right? Anything you want to share. Um, it's also great if you have a shared space between the people like Slack or WhatsApp or something like that. So that if you want to share documents or anything, you can just use that because otherwise you're privileging the virtual folks with the Zoom chat, right? Um, so have another way of sharing documents between that group. Have a group email or a Slack. With Virtually Connecting, we had a Slack back channel with different channels for different topics. So you can just have a channel for that event so it doesn't get lost with other things. Um, okay, so these are two more questions from Michael. What structures we use to maximize engagement and learning for participants in the room and online? Uh, and sometimes I think the virtual and on-site would switch, like now it's time for someone on-site to answer, now it's time for someone virtual to answer. Make sure that the people on-site are addressing those uh, online. One of the issues with cameras is like, who's talking, right? Who's looking at which place? Sometimes to look at the camera, you end up not seeing the people, so that's tricky. And protocols for camera and all use. We kind of talked about some of that and how that reflects our values. Let me just say these things about equitable engagement that we, I think, came up with, and I'll see if anyone else. Introductions, Becky, yes. We, also, we always had a cool way to do introductions um, at the beginning. Uh, and if you had a small enough number, you could. Because we had a big number today, I sent you guys to breakout rooms to do that. But with virtually connecting, we were always like maximum 10, 15 people. So we usually had time. And Alan used to come up with some really cool questions for the introductions. It was not so like, not just like who I am and where I am, but like something more creative as well. But equitable engagement, the buddies on site and virtual, someone here was calling them uh, uh, advocates. I think advocates is such a good word for that because they're not just being friendly, they're being advocates for making sure everyone's voice does get heard. And we were very careful to talk about minorities, especially whether a number or identity get heard. The choices of how to participate, just allowing people to participate in chat or voice with cameras on or off, to ask questions ahead of time if they wanted to. Um, that's another thing that could work. Um, and this having time off the record made a huge difference. And we were talking about that earlier, the asynchronous engagement in between and the polling tools, even though that was not a virtually connecting thing. So I'm, I'm curious about what other things, folks, and I'm just gonna put a couple of articles related to intentionally equitable hospitality in the chat. Yeah, does anybody else want to talk about the after show or the pre-show? <laughs> oh, this one won't let me click, but I'll stop sharing the screen. <laughs> okay, that's interesting, Nancy. Yeah, you know, when you watch the sports and there's a pre-show and a post-show, those are things that we did. Especially when you think about this for um, on-site, if you go to an event on-site, people are having informal conversations over coffee before and after, and then the virtual folks don't get that. And so having the after you finish some time for the virtual folks to keep chatting in that informal way that's not part of the official thing makes a huge difference. Um, and it's, it's a lot of community building happens in those spaces. It's, Does anyone else want to add anything here? So we have about one hour left um, of the official time for this, half an hour left of the official time of this. Um, and I wanted to give folks time to, to talk to each other a little bit as well. 
um, and to look at what other kinds of questions we have. But we can still stay in the main room and I'll, I'll talk to each other. So I'll just share one more slide about um, <clears throat> intentionally equitable hospitality and some more questions that we can all talk through together, I think. Um, so this is more recent work on intentionally equitable hospitality and part of it comes from the pre-design phase. So who do you involve in the design of something in the first place? If you design, if you involve people who will be perpetually virtual, oops, that came out on the recording. Um, <laughs> you have to come and do this here. <laughs> All right. So who you do involve in the design? Are they people who are uh, marginal all the time? Are they people who are virtual all the time? Can they be involved in the design of how this works and testing it and making sure it works and making sure who is, you know, what's on the agenda? How can it privilege certain people? Uh, but then also design to anticipate inequalities and how to respond to them. How do you redress them? And then intentional adaptation in the moment, which you can't teach necessarily, but just keeping in mind that you can change your plan all the time. Uh, this is Adrienne Marie Brown who uses this term. And then Priya Parker in The Art of Gathering talks about generous authority. And that's when I shut someone up in order to make space for someone else. And then beyond the moment, this, this uh, sustainable community building and sustaining it outside the live session, right? Um, he was talking, okay, so Michael had questions about software and hardware. How do you do group work in hybrid situations? And do you have examples of a time you facilitated a hybrid meeting or session? What worked well and how would you do to improve it? I'd love to hear from others on these things. So group work in hybrid situations, how do you guys do it? And have you facilitated a hybrid thing that you'd like to share about that worked well? I like that term, agile moderating, meeting situation as is. Yeah, so that's the intentional adaptation part. When I think about group work and hybrid group work, I think about that one particular conference presentation we did where we brought in a different person on each laptop. Um, and yeah, there we go. She's got it on her phone even. Yeah. On my mug. On her mug. <laughs> yes. Um, people are coming in. And so we just had a different purse, a different lap, diff, a different laptop at each desk that allowed for a different virtual person to be in each group. Um, and I found that that, yeah, I, I, that was, it was a spectacular experience for everybody. How do other folks do group work in hybrid settings? Do you separate the virtual folks in their breakout rooms and the on-site folks in their on their tables, or do you tend to pair them up or mix them up? I'm curious about that one. We've done these um, uh, where we're in groups of about ten people. So in the physical space, the the chairs go into a circle, and so you break out there, and then you do a Zoom breakout room. Uh, for the virtual friends. But what I'm really excited about is uh, experimenting with these platforms where the Zoom friends could jump into something like spatial chat, where you become the little round avatars, and then you can move into your own groups. And then you could still be in one room, but like, let's say six groups. And you, so you would still see each other, you know? So I, I'm very excited about those possibilities instead of just the regular old Zoom breakout rooms. Mm -hmm. And then and then, and then, then having, I like the idea of having the live people um, connect more, but probably during meal breaks or something instead of the, the focused activity and the downtime making these connections more. That's and I, I'd love to hear what other people are doing during meal breaks and stuff to keep the connections flowing. In addition to your question, who else would like to talk about either group work and hybrid settings or experiences they've had or that question about you know connecting over informal or meal times or such. One of our friends from who, who used to be the virtual account used to do coffee hour, where you meet for coffee online. So you could still do that in a conference for the virtual folks, right? Verna, were you the person who was just speaking that I cut off right now? Good to see you. No, no. Hello, how are you? Hi, Ma. <laughs> everyone. Um, no, I just wanted to say, uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, how to mix people. So I, I think that in order not to, I mean, yeah, of course, there's so many, there are so many uh, contextual factors, but I think in an ideal situation, my ideal thing would be to really get the people on site 
to connect with the ones online and perhaps through some activity, etc. So, but the problem is until now, I haven't done it because of the sound, the microphones. So the problem is you've got to tell people. So if they haven't got headphones, that is the problem. So I ended up in a situation where it was very last minute. I was listening with interest with um, about, you know, not having time to set up. And I assumed because of what it looked like that we could automatically see each other, but that wasn't the case. So then a student saved me because he thought, oh, no problem, I'll connect with my laptop and I will turn the laptop so that the people online can see everybody with the laptop. And I thought, wow, I would have never thought about that. And then, uh, but the problem was, yeah, that very few people had headphones. And so it would have been very messy to do this online on set. So, but that's my next thing. I want to definitely try people um, that so obviously you have to uh, set it up as an activity and uh, they need to know what, what is it they're talking about, etc. I think for me, it was more a question of managing the sound. So it worked really well. They, I put, I created bigger rooms for the people online and groups for the people on site. And then we had a plenary. Uh, there was no problem, but just I thought it would be interesting to try the other, the proper hybrid, let's say. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Verna. I think if you have a big enough pace, uh, the audio doesn't become as big of a problem because you can just have different laptops on different um, tables. That's what we had done before. And so if there's enough space, it's noisy anyway in the room, but it's not going to be as awful. Um, in terms of the, the sound going around, you know? It's going to be noisy just because people are talking, not because of the laptop um, audio. Uh, Dom, is, uh, so someone put a link to Ken's coffee, and uh, Dom's talking about icebreaker. Make sure everyone look at each other or their cameras and waves. Oh, that's nice. Thank you for sharing that. I'll take a look at that later. Can you contribute that to the 1HE resources? Yes, Louis or Louis? Yes, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit late. Uh, did you talk about this kind of thing? To... No, is it a is it a speaker? Yes, it's a fantastic uh, speaker and microphone. Jabra, I'm not. Uh, I, yes, I don't have this, is, with them. this is like Martin Weller, but I forgot yes. what it was called. Thank you. So okay, it's so Jabra. it's very effective, including to have in a room like fifty people and few people remote. And then they can get a perfect noise, uh, perfect sound. Yeah, and it, it connects with USB, right? It's very light and easy to uh, connect. Yes, or uh, USB or even uh, by uh, uh, Bluetooth. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, excellent. Yeah. Thank you so much, Louis. I've forgotten what it was called. We talked about it, but we didn't say what it was called, which is not helpful for anyone. So this is really helpful. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. All right, what about other ideas? Anyone else want to share? At least you look like you really want to say something, but it could be to someone else. I don't know. So. <laughs> nope, just, uh, just oh my goodness, time zones. So sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if anybody else had the wrong time on their calendar and the right time in the thing, that's my fault. And uh, welcome. So glad you're here. This is why we used to do this automatic uh, time zone converter on uh, virtually connecting. So the person who's doing it does it at their own time zone. They're sure it's going to be the right one. And it converts and we all see that. But it's OK. I'm glad you could make it and we're recording. So you can, you can catch up later. All right, we've only got about 20 minutes left. And OK, nice, nice to have you, Alan. I wonder if we could actually take some time to think about one thing that we will do differently in future to increase this intentionally equitable hospitality in sessions that we host. So um, I'll give you guys time to think about this and maybe write a little bit in the chat. And I'm also gonna check the questions that folks might have asked on Mentimeter to see if there's something that came up there that we didn't answer at all or didn't address at all. And Maha, this is Michael. I just want to interrupt. I too am going to have to drop off. But wow, no I just I just really want to thank you. And let's continue to do this. A simple tweet turns into a, a synchronous session with so many colleagues. Yeah. So I'm just so grateful for you actually shepherding this. And uh, the chat is just on fire. And uh, just what great resources. Thank you all so much. No, no problem. And actually, one of my other questions is, what are you still curious about that can offer more sessions on? So this could be a snowball effect, really. 
Uh, people like the idea of a quiet room. So you missed this, uh, Michael, but I, when I did breakout rooms, I also had a quiet room if someone didn't want to talk. Mm. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you yeah. so much. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. You too. All right. I'm just How did you tonight. alert people of the breakout room? I'm sorry I missed that. The quiet yeah, room? Yeah, no problem. So, so like, basically, like, yeah. So I was going to say, because right now we have a separate person organizing the breakout rooms. So mm -hmm. how do you let that person, uh, the attendee, alert the breakout room yeah. organizer that they want to be in a quiet right. room? Right. So first of all, you create the rooms, whatever you name the other rooms or keep them with their names. You create one that's called the quiet room that's extra. Um, you let people know that it exists. They can send a private message to the to the person, just let them know who the person is that they send a private message to, to let them know, or you just allow people to select their own breakout room. But if you're having a very small activity, like with pairs, you want to make sure that person doesn't end up in a pair. So you need them to send earlier. And so in this case, someone just sent me and let me know. Um, but yeah. also if you could just allow people to move themselves and then just be vigilant that if you have know, if are groups of five or six, it's not a problem. Hopefully not all five will leave one person on their own. But if they're twos or trios, then you do need to check before you send them. Does that help? Fantastic. I'm definitely going to use yeah. that. Thank you. I'm glad people still remember the first thing we did when we came in. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, all right. Uh, Irene, and then I'm going to check Elisa's question in the chat. Irene, what were you going to say? I, uh, I'm, I'm just um, thinking that we probably forgot how to check on the people that are in our space if they can navigate because we've been we've been facilitating we've been in so many spaces we've been in so many online meetings we forget that there are actually people who don't know how to navigate or find their places in in uh in online uh, mm -hmm. meetings so yeah. I, I think it's important for us to keep on reminding people where to find things and just mm -hmm. say for those who are new here, just to make sure that those who know where to find things, they don't yeah. get bored. Yeah. yeah um, I think these vital checks are, are the, you know, that could be one of your vital checks, right? I think that, the, yeah. well, you know, she mentioned Miro and Mural, and I go to a lot of spaces where people assume that people can use these, and they're really yeah. hard to figure out the first, really hard. It's the first time, but that first time can turn people off. And, and you know, with virtually connecting in the first run, we used to send instructions for how to use Google Hangouts back in the day. People assume everyone can use Zoom right now and don't ask that and don't give you instructions for doing that. And I think, yeah. And where to find different things as well. Because it's not usually just the Zoom, there's usually other contexts. Elise, you were talking about a multi-site hybrid event for July. How would that be different? Oh, that's like everybody is in a room. I hate these contexts, it's so complex. <laughs> so this is uh, what we call distributed site type of thing right like different people in different rooms together it's so difficult to get those people as individuals to connect with each other right they did a liberating structures event like that did anyone attend it it was some people in their own rooms and some people virtual and people in different places doing the same thing at the same time but i didn't manage to to participate i i wanted to comment that that the key for some of that is making explicit activities where people can connect across locations. You can't assume, you can't just say, oh, there's a drop-in room that people can go to. That does not work. It mm -hmm. needs to be an explicit, you know, in essence, it's a session or something where people very explicitly connect across spaces. And, you know, yeah. then you get like one person in each space going online or something to, to mm -hmm. actually try and cause that. Yeah churning maybe certain moments but not all the time because it'd be exhausting but like certain moments for like a half hour groups of two from different sites meet with groups of two from other sites and and make sure you have space and good audio and <laughs> it's 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 a hassle or pairs and make sure everyone has headphones um and maybe for that kind of thing keep the same pair so they get to know someone I think the issue is also, I think what I don't like about that one is the camera will always be very far away from everybody's face and it's less human if you don't get close to the faces. And that's what I hate about like very big rooms. 
Like if I give a keynote as a virtual and everybody else is in a room, they see me as this huge person on the screen and I see them as tiny. I don't see their facial expressions. So, and maybe also, at least I don't know if you missed this part where we were talking about using your phone because when you use a phone, the person is up close and the, cat, the, phone, the audio will always work. So if just different people connect to each other with the phone and a headphone, you can do a mad T, a wild T that way. And I've done it that way in my classes before. Dom, you had your hand up. Yeah, I was just thinking about the distributed one. Um, I mean, Heather's really kind of made a similar comment in the chat as well. But uh, uh, we've got a uh, set up at City with one of our buildings has like eight hybrid rooms. And we ran a, we ran a hybrid conference, uh, a teaching and learning conference there earlier on this year where we were basically trying to do all things in all spaces and all times at the same time. And um, I mean, it's a, it's as you say, Maha, it's a it's a super challenge to get right. Um, you do need um, individuals in each place coordinating things, like you know, mm. some, a, a co-pilot or a facilitator in each physical room that is on top of the online stuff as well. But a key thing there as well, I think, is the design of things. And it might be just as simple as, you know, how you put your, how you structure the table in a Google Doc with the right number of Zoom URLs, uh, mm -hmm. you know, just as a simple thing. But just thinking through the design of mm -hmm. how is this going to be so that wherever you are in that context, you can easily navigate to where you want to be. Yeah, that's a great point too. And using the right tool for that, whether it turns out to be a Google Doc or a Jamboard or whatever. Um, and Heather said something about having a tech host in each room and one for those working virtually. We have to remember probably the people in this space are all both tech savvy and good facilitators, but not everyone is both at the same time. And so sometimes you just need a tech host to manage the tech so that the facilitator can manage the facilitation. Uh, and even when we're good at this, it's exhausting. So having two people uh, and for every distributed space, having the uh, someone responsible there. So Louis and then Elise also had her hand up, and we have ten minutes. Louis, go ahead. Am I saying you? Is it Louis or Louis? Uh, depends. If Louis, I'm strong, but I'm French, so Louis like the king, you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, I went with the last name looking French. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Don't worry. Um, uh, sorry, I I, I missed uh, the first part of the of the. Of no the problem. Series. Nevertheless, I would like to quote just one platform I'm starting to use called Global. Uh -huh. I don't know if you know it. It has been developed by French people. Sorry for this. And uh, it's amazing. So it's a, it's where you can move from table to tables and uh, and it works very well. So I just sent um, the, the the name because it's written in a, in, in a special way. But uh, mm -hmm. if you want to explore, uh, it it is working very well. So but if you ever do a session where you invite people to explore it, yes, uh, would you, you would you let table. us know? Ah, sorry. Uh, yes, yes, of course, of course. I think they would be pleased. I don't know of their uh, English accent or, or language, oh. but I'm sure that uh, Sophie, with the the CEO of the company, would be yeah. very pleased to um, to make a demo. I'm sure. So okay, I'll bring a francophone friend. Uh, my mom speaks French. I can bring her. <laughs> um, thank you for that. That's very yeah. useful. You're welcome. That's also like one of the things I worry about these platforms, this one and Wello and things like that is um, what about people who have visual impairments would they be able to, to manage? But they're all they're really engaging. And uh, my daughter loves it when I'm on one of these things. Uh, Elise, did you still want to talk or? You had your hand no, up I was earlier. just curious about the. Um, so and and Louis, just in to double extend that invitation, we have hosted several, you know, come play with the platform demos things. So if you want to get your friends to come play, that would be amazing. But um, on the multi-site hybrid question, I'm wondering, has anybody experimented with having each of the localities run a separate or an independent program and then connect? Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, that could that could work, I think, so that they settle first. I think it would be frazzling in the beginning to, to do that, right? Uh, but definitely the connection needs smaller, a smaller group in some way. Maybe even they could be, if they're, how many sites is the one that you're doing? That's a good question. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> many, 
probably. Many. Like, ten, like maybe eight, ten. Eight with how many in each room also? Well, we, you know what, Lise? Let's have a session just on that problem. Okay. Right? Because I think that needs a lot of... And I think everyone will benefit because there may be a time in the future where all of us have to deal with that. So yeah, that'd be fun. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, because the numbers will make a difference as to whether you create different Zoom links for them or you just do breakout rooms. And then how do you sort of rename people to make sure you get a different person from each site together? <laughs> yeah. There was one time that folks did something really lovely in a virtually connecting session where they, they took one of these and one of these and they shared earbuds. So you have two people talking and listening. I do this with my daughter, but they were not mother and daughter <laughs> who did that. It was very cute. Uh, so that they could be close to the camera and still hear very well. Nan, go ahead. Thank you. Um, speaking of tools that we like, um, I was a filmmaker before I got into this space. And I don't know if you guys use any of these, um, but for kind of those uh, uh, informal sessions where people are milling around, uh, you put your phone on it. Uh -huh. And then it also has an extender so you can like really get good shots from above and then bring it right up to people and it's a gimbal so you get a very smooth camera movement uh DJ, dji i have to look up which gimbal this is but anyway this is wonderful for atmospherically you know being a camera on zoom and then 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 you become the live feed That's and then really you can nice. go up and talk to people and show the room and and uh i've been on walks you know when we the live attendees take a walk in nature and we'll have like three of these uh -huh. recording the walk low Very angle nice. so it's a wonderful so this is originally meant like a an advanced selfie stick but you can use it for hybrid meetings exactly that's yeah. awesome i love it this is song. awesome is and that then how it, it's spelled g-i-m-b-a-l gimbal i'll look up I, I can't even remember i have to look up the the product name and then it can sit on a table too right. or be handheld i'll look table. it up and put it in the yeah. chat right now that's really really cool that beats what i what i actually do in my classes i run around with my phone or the students pass it around to each other but this would be kind of cool oh the moving around was kind of cool too it was good exercise but <laughs> But yeah, I like this a lot. Thank you so much. All right, it's five minutes from uh, our end time. I'm sorry that some people had the wrong time, uh, but uh, let us know what in the chat. So I, I was looking at the questions uh, that folks left on Mentimeter and they look like questions that we've sort of answered in some way or another um, in this session, but we could always hold more sessions to do other things. So one idea is to focus on this distributed on-site Thing and talk about I mean we could talk about a new rules for work obviously at least and if you want to put a do you want to mention that real quick and put the link in the chat so Elise is co-organizing or organizing are you lead organizing or co-organizing this uh yeah co-organizing um yeah so we are we are running a multi a large uh symposium and multi-site quasi-experimental research project which begins with a symposium in January um, the symposium will be all online, and uh, how, Maha's going to come and share some more ideas about intentional um, equity and hybridity. If that, and we'll also have some uh, some other folks you probably know. And then, and then we're going to run this big experiment and share the results of the experiment at the multi-site hybrid event in July, which is we have not yet picked sites nor dates because we haven't run the experiment yet <laughs> but, but that's that it's going to be july and it's going to be amazing so so first step register for the symposium january 17th to 19th it's january 17th yes. to 19th multi-time zone right like multi-time zone right so and and uh there are we are setting the program now so if people have strong recommendations about things we should do to make it more equitable that would be fabulous um but we are starting in european african sort of midday and we go through uh australia asia midday with big breaks in between um our platform our event platform is crowdcoms 
So they'll be handling the agenda and the, the live streaming and, and connecting to resources, but it'll be primarily Zoom and whatever people bring. Um, and in addition to like sessions and workshops and whatnot, we're going to be crowdsourcing challenges because the whole experiment is about unleashing team creativity. So we'll be running these ideation like brainstorms for the experiment. And the question is, what should we be brainstorming about? So we'll be crowdsourcing that during the symposium and a number of other things. So we would love to have you. And right now, because we have not published the program yet, it's on leap of faith pricing. <laughs> which is a, a discount that will end at the beginning of uh, next month so that I can afford to actually host it. But I'd love to have you there. I, I would take that leap of faith. And uh, I'm saying this because I've been, I, I met Elise about a couple of months ago and I've been in communities where Elise works and uh, I'm, I'm just gonna, if you know me, I recommend this. <laughs> if you like the kinds of things that I like, you're gonna like this. And I don't even know what's going to go there, but because at least it's organizing it and that community is uh, is like the kind of people that are here, I think so. I think we're all going to learn together. And I think it's also about who gets there, right? Who goes is what happens. So That's right. Let's go there and do this because it's an invitation to experiment and try something new and aspire towards how we want future uh, good practice to be, right? That's right. And, and a, an opportunity to, to bust some myths, right? And in, influence yeah. yes. uh, the larger conversation in a positive way, as opposed to a doom and gloom kind of way all the yes. time. So. Yes, 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 exactly. Because there were some people who were asking in the Mentimeter, you know, about, uh, you know, about how people are overworked already and asking them to do hybrid is asking them to do even more work. And how can we do this in ways that don't burn out people who are already burnt out after two years of what we've all been through, right? Thank you all so much for joining us today. It's exactly half past and time for us to go. Thank you so much. If you want to post anything in the chat that you want us to keep thinking about or go back to the Google Doc um, and keep writing about what you want. We had Slack for virtually connecting uh, that kept us going for a very long time as our uh, continual thing. But if you're part of the meeting innovation community, there's space to chat over there, right, Elise? Asynchronously. Mm -hmm. um, and everyone else who's not in the meeting innovation community, I think, knows me in some other way. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, let's keep talking um, and hopefully we'll, we'll organize something again soon. And, I'll, and I'll, if you guys don't mind, I can let you know if Elise and I organize that other thing separately from the new rules for work, or if it's happening in new rules for work, we can let you know that it's happening there, right? Oh, we should do it here because this is a this is our free open venue. So okay. we might as well make, keep it be free and open, right? Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I'm going to stop recording and do the virtually connect.